会头。Hello everyone, it's Mr. Seri. Sorry for a bit of the hair situation here. I was going for the engineer look, but I noticed I can't keep a pen and my glasses at the same time. But whatever, we're gonna drop the pen. The pen, you know, you should imagine it being like right here. And why am I <laughs> dressed like this today? I don't know why. Uh, but the main reason is I want to make this video talking about Scapular Combiner, and I'm gonna take the opportunity to teach you how to build uh, business cases. In order to convince your boss to be able to do what you want in the place where you work okay let's start what is the business case and you know most of you guys are pretty sure you're kind of having some kind of technical scientific background not many of you are in a business background and i'm not also in a business background and as i was growing i was a young lad i didn't think i would need to build a business case i actually didn't even know what a business case was there's people like from another building that said those words but basically, if you're an engineer or scientist or pretty much anyone that will have a decision to make in terms of purchasing anything, you need to be able to make business cases in order to convince your, your audience, which will be normally your boss, or even convince yourself of what are the best options available. So what to do if you want to build a business case? I mean, it's not really a business case. It's much more about being able to compare two different things. That is the kind of essence of a business case. So when an, an, an entrepreneurial company makes a business case, they're trying to compare how good they are in comparison to the average factory, average uh, company in the market, right? So they want to show the people that if you invest the money on me, you will get 300% more than if you invested in somebody. You know, the most important thing when you come to, it comes to this is to find what I would call relative measures. So when you compare two things that are vastly different, you need to find a way to compare them. It's very hard to compare, for example, a normal food processor with an industrial food processor. You know, and if you had, let's say, a food company, you would have to choose between one of them. You know, maybe it will depend on the size of your company, it will depend on your budget. But let's say you have money for 10 small processors or one big processor, right? How do you compare that, right? So. The most important here is to find these relative measures. And you know, the example of the food processors may be a bit far-fetched from my usual audience. So I'm gonna talk about a much more common problem, which is Scabier Recombiner. So in order to assess how good Scabier Recombiner is, imagine you are uh, basically a worker in a hard skills factory, and you are asked by your boss, should we purchase a playset of Scabier Recombiners at three euros a piece, or shouldn't we? And then, you know, if you look at the card, you can look at it right now. It looks really, really good. It has a lot of abilities, it has a lot of text, it has a uh, full names on it, like as construct, as modular, all those things kind of make you salivate a bit. You have not seen a modular card since two, 10 years ago, right? But how good is it really? How good is Caviar Combiner really? And in order to be able to, you know, say if we want to buy a, a Scavier Combiner or not, or basically put it in our deck, we need to kind of assess comparatively with the other cards that are already in our deck, right? Because normally what happens with investments is that they are limiting, you know? There is a limitation on how many cards you can have in your deck. Well, you can have more than 60 cards, but normally you want to keep it to 60 cards. Similarly, you can assume that this is a budget of a company. A company has a limited budget and there's a limited amount of things they can buy. So you need to find what is basically the most worth for your money, the most worth for your cards in your deck. Right, so to compare Scabby Recombiner, I'm going to go for a very simple uh, measure, which is cost effectiveness or basically mana efficiency in this case. So how much the car does for how much it costs. So Scabby Recombiner actually has uh, basically three parts to it, right? So Scabby Recombiner is a modular two creature, and I think that's actually the most important part of the car. It has a sacrifice ability and it has a tutoring ability, right? So it's important to kind of look at it, like break it down in the three different individual uh, components and then see if the components together still make sense to be put into our deck. Let's start with modular. And we, to compare modular, we're going to compare it to basically the other modular creature that is not Armand Ravager. All cards in our deck fall to Armand Ravager. Armand Ravager is the best card in Harman Scales. But let's compare it to, for example, Armand Worker, the often unsung hero of the deck. And to compare here, I'm going to find the measurement of counters per mana. So let's start looking at Scabby Recombiner and let's compare them in different situations. 
Let's start with Scalier Combiner. Let's say we just cast a Scalier Combiner and it dies. You know, it just gets bolted, fatal pushed, whatever. You know, it's not sacrificed to anything. This is kind of like the most baseline case. You know, you play the card and it dies and you have something to put the counters onto. That would be sort of the, you know, like if you have nothing to put your counters on, you lost the counters, right? But that's not good play. So let's assume you already have something to put your counters on, but you have nothing else to sacrifice it. So let's say with Scalier Combiner, you will get two counters in this case and you have spent three mana so you get basically 0 0.66 counters per one mana spent if you look at the Armand worker in comparison if in the same situation where you play the worker and it just gets vaulted right away and put the counters on something else then you will get one counter for one mana so you have actually made basically one counter per mana spent so you actually can see how Armand worker in the baseline case is more efficient and Scabion and Combine, and it's normally kind of the reason why Armor is so good, even though we don't really think about it. Let's look at another case. Let's think about the case we have Harmon Skills, because of course we know we have ways to double counters, we have ways to take more advantage on the base model, and that's basically the way the deck is built. So you have, let's say, Harmon Skills in play, and you cast a Scabion Combiner, you will come in with three counters, and then it will die, and you can put four counters on another creature, right? Because you will have three plus a hundred skills, four. That will be a total of seven counters per three mana. That equals 2.33 counters per mana. In the case of the Iron Worker, you play the Iron Worker, you will come in with two counters into play, and then you will move the counters to a creature, basically moving three counters, that's two plus the extra hundred skills gives you, that will be five counters. You will get five counters per one mana. Let's look at the final case, and I think you can kind of notice a trend here already. Let's say we have Ozolith, Hunt Skills, and Scavier Combiner. So Scavier Combiner goes into play, dies, comes in with three counters into play, three counters go into the Ozolith, four counters go into the creature of your choice, and then four more counters will go into that creature thanks to the Ozolith, right? So that will be 11 counters for three mana, and yes, I need to make the mana. And that will be 3.66 periodic counters. <laughs> Per mana spent. If we compare this to a worker, a worker will come in with uh, two counters, it will move three counters to a creature, and it will get extra three counters to a creature thanks to the Ozolith, right? So we'll end up making eight counters per one mana spent. So, in conclusion, in terms of modular, Scrap Yard Combiner is not good compared to another card that we already have, which is uh, Arbok Worker. Of course, Scrap Yard Combiner has, when, when mana is not a limiting factor, Let's say when, you, when cards are a limiting factor, let's say you have 10 mana available, so you have infinite budget of mana, then of course Scrap Yard Combiner is better for the model ability because it gets more total counters. But when mana is a limiting factor, which will be most of your games of Magic, because normally, you know, you will not have 20 turns to play a, a game. You probably have like five, six turns to make an impact or else you will just kind of lose and no matter what you draw afterwards, you know, you will lose. So. When mana is a concern, the modular ability on Arban Worker is much more efficient and therefore it can make much more of an impact earlier on. Compare these two situations. Let's say you are on turn three, you play a Scabular Combiner. Yeah, you maybe have 100 skills and maybe you put it something else. Playing a Scabular Combiner and dying gives you a lot of counters, but nothing else on turn is spent. Let's say you are on turn three and you can play a Ravager and an Arban Worker. Whoa, that is like an almost a threatening win on turn four because you can generate so many counters out of the Worker and you still have, have been able to play a Ravager on top of your mana or your counter generating creature. The second ability on Scapular Combiner's repertoire is a Sack Outlet. And in here we can compare it to, uh, to basically Sack Outlets that don't generate so much advantage in our deck, which could be Throne of Geth and Phyrexia Score. None of them are, are, most of those cards are mostly used for the Sacrifice ability. And, you know, on top of that they have some extra uh, value in the Texas score is a land and Throne of Geth can help you proliferate which can be really really strong but most of the time you know if Throne of Geth has another ability and help you proliferate but it didn't sacrifice it would not be, be so useful and here the main difference is is the opportunity cost of both when you play a Scabular Combiner you're investing three mana into maybe and that answer is maybe having a sack outlet the turn after whereas both Phyrexia Score and Throne of Geth are costing less mana in case of Phyrexia Score costs 0 mana and Throne of Geth costs 2 mana. And you get an immediate uh, uh, access to a Sack Outlet. That is very, very strong. That's a big difference. So in terms of uh, Sack Outlet prowess, you could, should compare it more like 
how many turns so basically like how basically if you say you can play it on turn one after you cast it you can use it on turn one after you cast it you can do it on turn two after you cast it like how many turns does it take for you to get one sacrifice ability and basically you can see that this will be a very linear thing Cabular combiner gives you one sacrifice after turn two first turn of geth and this score gives you ability to sacrifice twice by turn two on top of that, Sacrifice Ability divided by mana is also in favor of the other cards because Phyrexis card doesn't cost any mana, but it costs one mana to activate, which, you know, we should counter on that. So, like, let's say it gives you one Sacrifice for one mana, Turn of Geth gives you one Sacrifice for two mana, Cabular Commander gives you one Sacrifice for three mana. Lastly, the Tutoring Ability on Scabular Commander is something like we don't have much on in our hard skills. The only thing that comes even close to it will be Ancient Steering, so I could like look at the five top five cards of our deck. But Scabby Recombiner basically allows us to look for anything in our deck, any construct in our deck, basically walking ballista. <laughs> and yeah, get in our hand. So in that sense, Scabby Recombiner has the leg up to any other card in our deck. It's a new effect. The problem is, is this kind of effect is sometimes I think uh, thought like people only look at the upside and then don't look at the downside, right? So if you play a Scabular Recombiner, then you need to wait one turn, then you need to tap it, then you need to sacrifice a, a, an artifact that you control, then you get to look for the Ballista, then you need to cast the Ballista and get into play, right? So even though this looks uh, very strong, right? You get to get the Ballista, you get to do that. This is only really good in the cases where you have nothing else to do with your mana anyway, and you didn't need the sacrifice ability for something else. So like. For example, you maybe would like to hold on the Scabular Commander to sacrifice a Hangabout Walker, but if you do that, maybe that's not a good time to go okay, get a Walking Ballista, right? In general, of course, Scabular Commander at this point, when you have untapped with it and you have plenty of mana and you don't have anything to do with your mana, Scabular Commander is, of course, one of the best cards in our, in our deck that you could possibly have in the battlefield at that moment, but this doesn't happen as often as you would hope for. Opponents have removal opponent attacks you, opponents have sometimes, you know, op sometimes the card will be too slow for it to be effective, right? So in my mind, when I'm looking at this card, the, un the way to, basically the tutoring ability, I will compare it to the Steel Overseer. Steel Overseer is a card that if you untap with it, it's really, really strong, like it has a very high ceiling because let's say you untap with it turn two, you tap and you put uh, counters on an extra counters on a Ballista, Extra kind of Silver Seer that can go into the Ozolith, etc. Yeah, the card is really, really busted. At that point, if they have not stopped the turn two, chances are they will not be able to stop the turn three or four or five, unless you know they 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 find like a four wipe or something. Scabular Recommender has a similar profile in the sense that once you untap with it and you sag, you start generating this value. You can look for Hangout Walkers. You can find Walking Ballistas. You can eventually just win the game outright, right? But what happens is a lot is the timing, right? If we compare the likelihood of you untapping with a turn two Steel Overseer versus you untapping with a turn three Scabby Recommander is very low. And Steel Overseer has the thing that it doesn't need more help. Steel Overseer, as long as you have something else to put counters on, which most likely you will if you play the turn two, basically it will win the game on its own. Whereas Scabby Recombiner, you, keep to, you need to keep investing mana on it. You need to find the Ballista, you need to sacrifice something you have, find the Ballista, play the Ballista and keep going like this. So, it is in a way a bit more of a investment kind of card. Like imagine you sacrifice a Dark Souls Citadel, look for a Ballista and it gets countered. Ah, then the Scavenger Commander did not really have any big effect on the on the battlefield. But if you have no other threat, Scavenger Commander is of course really, really good. And here's the final point I want to make. So why am I playing Crystal and Giant then? So I talk a lot about Scavenger Commander and I look compared it to Crystal and Giant. And basically the reason I'm playing Crystal and Giant is again, Crystal and Giant is not a very efficient card in terms of mana cost. It's a three mana three three for three mana. But what I like about it, that I think it works really well with the rest of scales, is first of course the counters can go into the Ozolith. But second of all, it's a threat that when you play it, that is that is it. You have to invest nothing else on it. You don't have to tap it. You can attack with it every turn. You don't have to and any extra mana, put any extra counters. There's no synergy required, basically. That'll be a combined, I mean, sorry, Crystal and Giant will every turn generate value for you at a zero cost once you have cast it. But Scalpier Commander will generate a lot of value, but it needs to get tapped so it cannot attack. 
and if you sacrifice things and you need to spend mana to cast those things it is a stronger ability yes it is a stronger ability and the seal and the bot let's say the floor of the card is very good because you have the modeler ability but for me crystal and giant it's in very well in this niche of a card that will do something in its zone without needing any extra help and they can run away with the game if it doesn't get answered right because after you've probably seen it in my videos and if you haven't i recommend you go watch them once you have on top with a crystalline giant and you have like two three four ability counters the card becomes almost impossible to beat it's very hard for certain opponents to beat like flying vigilance menace um lifeling also hex proof all those abilities are actually first strike death touch all those cards abilities are actually very relevant and a lot of our other cards can take a big advantage of it have you ever put menace counter on a nimoth nexus have you ever put Lifeling on a Ballista, Death Touch on a Ballista, Hexproof? You know, Hexproof wins the game out, almost outright and versus any uh, removal heavy opponent, right? Of course, there is an element of randomness to it and sometimes you will not draw what you need, get what you need. But in general, I think that all the abilities are relevant enough that they can actually come up and, and, be, and be good for you. And as I said, as not an extra investment, you just play it if it gets past to exile, you get your extra land. If the, the worst thing, Crystal and Giant is really bad when there's a light, uh, basically Bolt. Bolt is kind of the worst against uh, Scrap, uh, against Crystal and Giant because it's a three, ma three mana for one mana kind of exchange, which is really, really bad. But it's a similar situation with almost all our creatures, right? If you get your Worker Bolt, it feels kind of bad. If you get your Ravager Bolt, it feels extra bad. If you get your Ballista work, uh, Bolt, it gets really bad. So Bolt is one of actually the best cards. That is an alarm. Um, it's one of the best cards against us if it's allowed to be efficient. You know, like we have lots of ways to not make it efficient. But that's why I'm playing the Crystal and Giant. It's a three man investment that can take over the game on its own, can win us some games that we were, had no business winning, and it requires no further investment. So I can, I always feel uh, when I'm playing Hardland Skills, it's not necessarily the overall power of the card that is most important, it's the efficiency of the card. If you look, we have mostly one drops and two drops that are kind of mopey on their own, but working together, they're really, really strong. So I'm, my focus is always on how do I get the most amount of creatures onto the battlefield quickly or the most amount of counters quickly. I'm not interested in a card that will generate a lot of advantage in a really long time on its own. I'm more interested in being able to deploy all my face really, really quickly and having always, let's say, the ability to, to take advantage of these synergies. Whereas a card like Scrap, or a Combiner, it benefits more from kind of a long and slow approach where you know you just take the thing take turn seven turn eight turn nine and you keep on grinding you got keep on getting these valuable plays and eventually beating your opponent and that was uh, probably against band snowblade that was a really good strategy because band snowblade had uh, basically the games were really really long and between animation model and scabby recommender you could outgrind them almost for sure but right now the, the reality is that the, the decks that are wanting to play a longer game we will, will beat you anyway because they have feel of the dead so they'll make 25 different tokens and then it doesn't really matter if you can keep on getting ballistas they will just grind you they will counter your spells they will bounce your dudes etc so in my recommendation right now is to play crystalline giant because it's this kind of thing you can put down and if your opponent has no answer for it you can take over the game and you can spend your mana on using the like the rest of your cards in your hand instead of having to use your mana in getting those cards in yeah that is the video i hope you have found it helpful i hope you have found you know basically this is quite relatable to the way you would actually decide on purchasing something for a company as i said about the food processors before it's very important to look at these kind of relative measures and see what actually makes sense for 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 you or the situation you're in you know, a lot of the times people will get lost in the kind of uh, details or in the most fancy packaging. That's one of the reasons they sell when they, you know, they give you a PlayStation 4 when you buy a car. Like, what? why would you consider a PlayStation 4 and a car kind of in a similar situation? But it's kind of this cherry on the top kind of mentality that will people, you know, people get excited about. So don't look at the, let's say, most fancy situation, most fancy equipment or most fancy uh, features of something look at the baseline look at what you're actually paying for which is normally like either the power or power per money or the tons of product that you can handle per euro that you invested or in this case how many counters will you get out of the car 
per mana you have invested. And also I must say that this title made me realize that Arvon Worker is an excellent card. Like it's one of the most, it's probably the most efficient counter maker in the whole deck and I've been cutting it a lot, maybe I shouldn't. Anyway, that is Mr. Seri bringing you hopefully something that makes sense for you. And I enjoyed making this video and I hope you enjoy watching it too. See you. And if you like the content, please like, comment, subscribe. Let me know down below what you think. And yeah, I'll see you next time.